I will explain. <laughs> Sometimes when I do little illustrations like this, I get to wear clothes that are a little more comfortable than traditional Sunday clothes. Today, that is not the case. But I will explain. And you all have a little piece of burlap next to you, some of, most of you. Keep that, on your, keep that on your hands. Maybe rub it on your forearms as we go through this service because this sackcloth has to do with what we're studying today. I, before I start, I just want to say thank you to those of you who prayed uh, for me during my retreat. It was an excellent time. Uh, one, of the, one of the highlights was actually this message that I'm going to preach to you. Generally, when I'm preaching, the staff will tell you, by the time Thursday rolls around, I'm fairly stressed, and I don't talk to anybody because I just lock myself in the office and finish everything that I tried, I'm trying to finish. This sermon poured out in about a day, maybe about three hours. I could not stop typing because the Lord just gave it to me. So I'm excited for, to preach it, and, uh, and I'm, I'll be praying for you as I preach it that it would be something that the Lord uses to speak to your heart. So I want to ask you, do you like second chances? You know, those opportunities that you have where you're like, if I could do that over again, I would. Have you ever had an opportunity in your life where like, I could have used a second chance on that one, right? I'm sure all of you have, and probably all of you have, can think of more than one instance where that's happened. Um, I think I've mentioned here that I've picked up a golf membership for the first time in my life this year, and, uh, and I have realized that golf is a merciless sport where you always learn the hard way and where second chances are a fiction. You don't get to take second chances in golf. Well, you can, and we've used ways to justify it. We call it a mulligan. Or we say, oh, I'll just like a quick do-over, or I'll just, hit, I'll, I'll just quickly hit another one. But all of those things don't exist in golf. If you ever look at professional golf, if they hit it in the water, you don't just get like to pretend that it didn't happen. You have to go to the water and you have to put your ball where it's a horrible position. You have to play it out of there. You don't get a do-over in golf if you have integrity. And I have struggled with integrity on the golf course. But that's why I golf with people. Because if I don't, I'll golf so good. But if I golf with people, I golf realistically and not well. Um, I thought, like, as I thought about second chances, I thought, man, golf would be a great place to have a second chance. But then I thought, man, what if life, what if you actually had second chances and do-overs in life where you could hit rewind, go back, and do that over again? I know every single person in this room would love to have a rewind button for some of the things that have happened in their lives. I know that I would. As you look back on your life, hindsight's 2020. You know what you would do over again. I know what I would do over again. And the amazing thing about today is that we are going to study a literal second chance and a what a man did with his second chance. It was a miraculous, gracious second chance, and we're going to study what happened because of that. So if you have your Bible on your phone or a paper copy, turn or tap to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. <clears throat> Jonah chapter 3, and we're going to read about this second chance. As you turn there, I'll remind you of what we've been studying. Right? Two weeks ago, Pastor Joe started us off in Jonah chapter 1 with God's call on that man, Jonah, to go and preach that Nineveh would be destroyed. <clears throat> Jonah was not going to preach hope. He was going to preach judgment. Judgment is not a popular message. All right, some of us have probably been even in church and felt looked down upon or judged by what the guy in the sackcloth is saying. And hopefully you won't feel that way today. But it was Jonah's job. Go and preach that Nineveh will be destroyed in 40 days. And Jonah did not want to do that. He rejected the call from God, and he endured some of the most creative discipline that we know about in the scriptures. He was pursued by the weather, 
And he was swallowed by a fish, spent three days in the belly of a whale, and then was vomited out onto the beach. All right, that is the context of what we're looking at this morning. Jonah lying on his back, in, looking up into the sky, and all of a sudden, a voice speaks to him. Jo Jonah chapter 3, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message that I have given to you. Now this right away, right away, is an amazing second chance. It is the exact same command that Jonah got. God does not rub it in. God does not give him extra hard time. He just says, get up and do what I told you to do. All right, if you look at Jonah 1, verse 2, it says, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh, announce my judgment against it because I've seen how wicked its people are. So this is the exact same command. God isn't snooty about it. God never says, I told you so. God never says, see. He just says, get up and get going. And now Jonah does it. He gets up and he gets going. But this reveals an amazing truth about God just in the fact that he gave Jonah the exact same command. Do you know what this means? It means that our God is a God of second chances. And truthfully, he's the God of like, 55th chances or a hundredth chances. Our God is so patient and so slow to anger when you think about it that many times if you are a Christian here and you know what God wants you to do and you've disobeyed, the fact that you didn't end up in a fish and puked up on a beach somewhere means that God gave you a second chance means that he has been gracious to you. The fact that we can actually as his followers Disobey God and live to tell the tale is incredible grace and incredible love. So let me ask you, those of you who believe here this morning, how many times, you don't, don't put your hand up, you don't have to do that, but how many times have you sinned in an intentional and repetitive way? How many times have you intentionally disobeyed God? Probably enough that it would be embarrassing to announce it out loud, and yet we are here to tell about it. We have the chance to learn from our choices. The fact that any of us can do that shows that God is gracious and loving. He is a God that is not primarily wrathful. We know that God is a God of love. He is a God of justice, absolutely. And he will do justice on the earth. But he desires a relationship with us. He is slow to anger and abounding in love. He doesn't hold grudges. And he Miracle of miracles, church. He has given the task of carrying out his will to you who believe. His will is that we do his will and carry out the mission that he has for the entire world. And that mission is to preach the gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's the basic message, mission, that Christians are on. There's another message and mission, which is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people, make disciples. And that's not just like entry-level Christianity. That's all. That's the mission. Make the, preach the gospel, make disciples, love one another. Our job is not just to understand God, because that's what kind of church can end up being is a message on who our God is. And that is amazing and wonderful and good. But the actions to that are to tell others. It's not enough just to take the information in. We have to pour the information out. We have to tell others about that. That's the mission of the church. The church is not this building. The church is all of you who believe. We need to go and we need to complete the mission that God has given us. And this is where we kind of run parallel with Jonah. Jonah was pretty transparent. He did not want to do this, so he literally ran away. That was, and we try to be a little more complicated. We try to be a little less transparent. Like sometimes we try to avoid the mission that God has given us in more subtle ways. Like saying, well, we're just, we're just a little busy right now, so we'll get to it next week. Or maybe we say, well, I don't want to make things awkward. 
so maybe I won't say anything this time. Or maybe we say, ah, it's not really my spiritual gift to preach the gospel, so I'm not going to. But I think all of these things are a little bit, maybe even a lot, of an avoidance of the mission that God has given to us. And I want want you to stop to consider something. All right, now this is not a principle. This is just something I need you to consider. But have you ever stopped to think about that some of the pain in your life as a believer may be as a result of the discipline of God? Have you ever stopped to think that some of the pain in your life is a result of the discipline of God who is trying to bring you back on mission? Not all the pain in your life, I wouldn't say that, but it is possible, and I don't know you this deeply, but it's possible that you are running away from what God wants for you. If you are, I wouldn't be at all surprised if some of the pain and difficult circumstance in your life is a result of the discipline that comes from God. Not because he hates you and wants to hurt you, but because he's trying to bring you back to where you need to be, where he wants you rather than where you want to be. And I can't and won't presume to know what that pain is. I'll let the spirit, God himself, reveal that to you. If you're a Jesus follower, Today here, in this room, if you say, I'm a disciple of Jesus, I follow him, you're a missionary. You are a missionary for the gospel wherever you go in the world. And we are in a very unexotic location, northeast Saskatchewan, right? There are not a lot of people who'd be like, I want to be a missionary to Melfort. Because, and, and not a lot of people are sent to Melfort because you're, there are so many missionaries here already. Every single one of you, if you believe in Jesus, you are a missionary in this community. And you have a command given to you by God to spread that message to Melfort, to make disciples of this community of Melfort. And you don't even have a difficult message. You just have the message, Jesus came and died and was resurrected again for you. And you can have eternal life if you put your faith in him. It's not a complex message but it's a hard one to live out. And so if you're one of the ones here that doesn't love sharing that message of Jesus, if you're avoiding sharing the gospel with somebody, God is giving you a second chance. God is giving you a third chance. God is giving you a 133rd chance. As children of God, we have a father who is patient with us, who is fair with us. If we are running away from the mission he has put us on, he'll discipline us because he loves us and it's gonna hurt But then hopefully we learn our lesson, correct, and keep going. And for those of you who are here who don't believe yet, or you're on the fence about this, take the opportunity that you're being presented with today. Today you're going to hear about the God of the universe who loves you so much he sent his son to die for you. I want you to start thinking about that now. And I want you to start thinking about why you're hearing this. Like, what of all the things that Phil could have talked about today, why is he talking about this, and why am I here right now? So, Jonah takes his second chance, and he heads out to Nineveh. And the Bible says that Nineveh is a great city. That word great in your scriptures doesn't just mean big, but it is big. It's like 150,000 people. But what? it's great to the Lord. It is an important city to him. He has a plan for Nineveh. That word great isn't just big. It's important to God. So Jonah goes, and let's let's continue reading. Verse 3. This time, Jonah obeyed the Lord's command, and he went to Nineveh, a city so large it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. I think Jonah had great enthusiasm at this point. I don't think he preached, you should change your ways. I think he was just like, y'all are going to burn 40 days. Put it on the calendar. God's going to get you. He hated the Ninevites. Jonah, I mean, to use harsh language, Jonah was a racist. He hated the Ninevites. They were a totally different nation. They were pagan. And he did not want Nineveh to have a hope So he just preached destruction. 
And this teaches us something about Jonah. See, we learned about God in verse 1 and 2. He's a God of second chances. Verse 3 and 4 teach us about Jonah. And we're a little, we can be a little disappointed at this point. Jonah has literally escaped death twice. He got thrown into the raging sea. Seaweed wrapped his head. He got sucked down to the bottom. And just before he was about to die, a whale came and <laughs> grabbed him, saved his life, held him in his tummy for a little while, and then puked him up on the beach after Jonah had the wherewithal to pray and say sorry to God. This is incredible. Jonah has experienced incredible grace. He's literally heard the voice of God audibly twice that we know of. And now, rather than pleading with people to change their ways because God is going to destroy them, he simply pours out all of his rage and venom and disappointment from having to do God's will into this message, and he just yells at them for three days. God is going to overturn your city. You are going to burn. He is going to fire, put fire and sulfur. It's over. You guys are dead, all of you. He, his heart is not broken about this. He wants to see it burn. It is so ironic because Jonah just received grace for doing something wicked. He disobeyed God's expressed order. He said, no, God, I won't. And God spared him. And then instead of pouring out any kind of heart onto these people, he just says, you're all dead. Ha ha. You can almost hear the ha in there. And get this, this is where the irony turns. Still ironic. Because even though Jonah has no heart for these people, he gets a 100% conversion rate as an evangelist. 100%. Take a look at this, verse 5. The people of Nineveh believed God's message. From the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and they put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne. He took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in burlap and sat on a heap of ashes. And the king and his nobles sent this decree throughout the city. No one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all violence. Who knows? Maybe God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. So Jonah de delivers his message brutally, hoping no one will respond. And yet everyone responds. Isn't this crazy? Think about that. This isn't 75%. This would, that would be amazing. In fact, if 75% of you remember what I preached on three weeks from now, I will be amazed. That's just remembering. This isn't 75. This isn't 95. This is 100% of people respond to Jonah's message of destruction from the king down. They put on sackcloth. Do you know how uncomfortable sackcloth is? And they all, and they, even the king, he sits on a pile of ashes. He is disgraced. He is in mourning. And, you know, sometimes we skip over this, but even the animals, you know, can you imagine, like those of you who are farmers, you don't feed your cattle. You don't water your cattle. They're going to die. And, and somehow you need to put sackcloth on your animals. Tim, would you put a sackcloth on the bulls? Like, you wouldn't live to tell the tale. How did this happen? I have no idea. But the Ninevites are so serious about repenting at this point. They said, it doesn't matter. No one's eating. No one's drinking. And get the sackcloth out. Even the animals. We're putting it on everybody. We got to show God we're sorry. And so we, can, we need to stop and examine two really important things here. Really important. First... There is power in the message the Lord gives you, no matter how poorly you deliver it. There is power in the message you have, no matter how poorly you deliver it. Don't get me wrong. In no way am I suggesting that you should do any less than your best than in delivering the message of the gospel. But when God gives you words, there are power in those words. Jonah is armed with the words of God, and he brought an entire city to its knees, literally, and Jonah doesn't even care. Jonah hates the Ninevites. He wants them to die, so he yelled at them, but the Lord took that ill intent, 
And he put his power into that message because it was his words and the whole city repented. Can you see the parallel people? We have a message from God. Literally, you have God's words, not just the message of the gospel, but this whole book. But let's just concentrate on that good news from Jesus. You have that good news and you have a command to tell everybody about it. You have a message from God. You have a message of power for Melfort. And I'm not talking about superpowers or anything like that. I'm talking about a message that you have that can change people's lives. You have words that have power in them through the Holy Spirit. You have a message for your neighbor. You have a message that Jesus gave you 2,000 years ago. That same message that spread all over the globe. There's a global community that have been impacted by this message. That Jesus came, that he died, and that he rose again to pay for the sin of the world. You have a command to speak that. Every single person in this room that says, I love Jesus, this is you. You can't get away from this. And the more that you try, the more the fish are coming. So if Jonah achieved such great results with a horrible attitude, imagine what we could do if we spoke the gospel with as much zeal as Jonah did, not in hatred for the people that we spoke to, but with love like Jesus did. Love is the motive power. It was love that caused God to do what he did. He sent Jesus to die. All right? He sent Jesus to die for me. I did not deserve that. I was a sinful man. I was broken. I was lost and dead in my sin. I didn't deserve Jesus, God himself, to die for me. There's no way. I deserved hell. But God didn't want me to go there. He doesn't want anybody to go there. So he himself came to the earth as a man and paid for you. Your ticket to heaven is paid for. All you need to do is repent and believe. That is an amazing story. If someone literally pushed you out of the way of, of a bus and got killed themselves, would you tell somebody about that? If somebody literally jumped in front of you and took a bullet instead of you, would you share that story? If God himself died to save you from hell, would you tell someone? See, if we're not careful, we'll become Jonah here. Jonah is a cautionary tale. We'll become Jonah. Because he showed, he took the grace that God gave, right? He took it, but he was unwilling to give it. He took it, but he was unwilling to give it. He did eventually, but with such a bad attitude. And then, but then God showed grace to the audience even though Jonah's heart was not broken for these people, God showed grace. And we're different. We're not Jonah. The gospel, the gospel message that Jesus came and died and rose again to give you eternal life, that is for every single pe person on this earth. The people that we really love and the people that we don't love. That gospel is for everyone. It is a message of power for every single human being on the face of the planet. And for us here in Melfort, we need to make sure that everyone knows about it. But the only people that can spread it are you guys. Only pe the people that I can speak to, they come into the church. I can go to a funeral or I can go to a wedding and preach the gospel. But I am not the only person that preaches the gospel. That is every single person in here's job because you are a missionary sent to this community. You cannot run from that message. Let God supply the results. You might say, I am not good at this. That's fine. Do you think Jonah was good at it? God did not supply 100% revival because Jonah was a talented speaker. He supplied the results in spite of Jonah. All, many of you here, if I said, hey, Matt Hess, do you want to preach on Sunday? Be like, nope. Why not? Because I'm not that guy. Do you know what? Not many of us would be like, I'm an evangelist and I want everybody about Jesus. That is a spiritual gift. 
But there is, also a, there is also this message that Jesus gave to everyone. Everyone needs to preach this. He'll supply the results. You just need to try. A lot of us don't try because we don't think that we'll be any good at it. Jonah was not good at this. So try and let the Lord supply the results. He just wants you to try. He'll supply. You put the effort in. He will supply the results. So the second thing that we need to notice here is the response of the Ninevites. Like, we said, like I said before, they all dressed in sackcloth and ashes. They stopped every single thing that they were doing. They didn't even eat or drink. And they just mourned their sin. And get this, they did, Jonah didn't tell them to do that. He just said, y'all are gonna burn up. This was their response. And they just didn't, they didn't even know if God was going to relent. Look at that letter that the king wrote. Everyone must turn from their evil ways and stop their violence. Who knows? Maybe God will change his mind. They didn't have a guarantee. They didn't know God was a loving God. All they knew about God was that he was going to crush them. And they, were, they mourned the evil that they did. They, they were distressed. And that's why they put this on. I want to tell you about that burlap that you've got in your pews, that I've got on my body. It's just about the worst thing I've ever worn in my life. Okay? Like, it's terrible. And I have an undershirt on underneath this. I cannot imagine if this was the only thing I was wearing. It's the itchiest, most horrible feeling clothing. But it's made so that you will feel on the outside how you feel on the inside. That's why people in the scriptures put on sackcloth because it's horrible. You feel horrible inside for what you've done. So you put sackcloth on on the outside so that your body is completely uncomfortable because your heart is completely uncomfortable. It reflects the distress of your heart and your soul and it doesn't let you forget. I find this very compelling actually. Let's dive down this trail a little bit. Because in these, I gotta, take a, I gotta take a drink. I'm talking too much. These days in our culture, we're not very open. True? We don't love to tell people how we're really doing, which is really ironic because the first thing that we say to people is, hey, Tyler, how's it going? And at that point, he either has to be very honest or very dishonest because I probably don't have time to hear how he's really doing, even if it was good. We just throw that out there really lightly. Hey, how's it going? Terrible. No one says that. It just doesn't come up. I find that disconcerting, especially in the church, because this is the place where we're supposed to be able to take our mask off. This is the place we're supposed to be honest. This is the, actually, we're supposed to be honest people. We're not supposed to be able to just casually lie about how we're really doing. But we do. We lie to people when they ask how we're doing. We, because we think that it's not really socially acceptable to say anything other than good and you. Have you ever felt that conflict? Have you ever felt like I am not being honest right now? How you don't want to even leave the house sometimes because you are struggling so bad and to face people and pretend like you're doing good is one of the most dishonest things that you could possibly do. So you don't even want to bother. But here's the thing. With this sackcloth and with the Ninevites, they don't hide it at all. From the king down. I think the scripture pays very close attention to that because it's not, the king is not more important. That's why I dressed up in this because I will look ridiculous for the chance to tell you about this. And it is ridiculous. But it gives me a chance to share with you how important it is that sin must be repented of. These Ninevites are terrified, sad, devastated, and they do everything they can on the mere chance that God is going to do something about it. And so how can we apply this, ladies and gentlemen? Repent of your sin and turn to God. Repent of your sin and turn to God. Simple as that. Mourn your sin. 
Wear sackcloth and ashes. Ask God for forgiveness. Follow him and his plan, not your own plan. Honestly, folks, if you don't believe today, if Jesus is not for you, you got to think about why you're here today. Why am I hearing this today? Because it's time for you to give up your own way and go with God's plan. Follow him and his plan, not yours. And do it today. Because one day, Jesus is coming back. And we don't know when that is. The Bible says that. Jesus himself says, I have no idea when I'm coming back. Only the God, the Father, knows that. See, the Ninevites had a known timeline. They knew when God was going to smoke their city. In 40 days, he was going to overturn Nineveh. So they had time. We don't. We don't know. And we might have 4,000 years We might have 400 years. We might have 40 days or we might have four. I don't know. Jesus said that no one knows the day or the hour. In this upcoming ministry year, we're going to talk about that a little bit, about what it means to be ready for the coming of Jesus. But right now, if you don't believe, it is time. That day is today. You don't know when Jesus is going to come back. You don't know when the world is going to end. You don't even know if you're going to have a good burger there today. I hope you will. But this might be your last day. It really might. I'm not trying to be flippant about that. There are times, and I'm sure many of you have at some point in your life experienced a death that you did not expect. You don't know when your time is up. And you're not a perfect person. And I don't mean that judgmentally because I am not a perfect person at all. No matter who you are, you're not a perfect person. And that goes pretty deep because not only are we not perfect, we are far from perfect. And we need help. The Bible says that we were dead in our transgressions and sins. We don't have any hope. We're just like the Ninevites. We need God to help us. Only God can help us. And he has helped us. He sent Jesus before we even existed. And Jesus has already died for your sin. While we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. So take that gift. Be like the people of Nineveh. Repent of your sins. Say you're sorry. That's all it takes. Ask for forgiveness and he will forgive you. Not only will he forgive you, he will give you so many things. One of the best things he gives you is this group of people. This group of people who are devoted to loving God and loving others with everything that they've got. Not perfectly, but we're trying. The church is an amazing gift that you will have that can help you in your walk with Jesus. Leave your life of sin behind today. Repent of your sin. That means turn and go the other way and believe that Jesus died for your sin and was resurrected. He is the king, whether you believe it or not. And it is time for you to give your heart to him. Remember what I said before about second chances. Maybe you're not a believer today and you've heard this before. But now you're hearing it again. Don't wait. It is not a coincidence that you are hearing this today. Take the second chance that you just got right now and give your life to Jesus today. There has to be a reason you've heard this message more than once. Because God is telling you that he loves you and wants a connection with you. He wants you to have eternal life. Take the step of faith and join his kingdom. God will forgive your sin. He will wipe it away. The Bible says he separates your sin so far that he doesn't even remember it anymore. It's right there in the Bible. Because this is what happens. The Ninevites, they are contrite. They put on sackcloth. They sit on ashes and they repent of their sin. And look at verse 10. Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. When God saw what they had done and how they put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the destruction that he had threatened. That is incredible. God determines, Nineveh, you're done. But Nineveh says, we are so sorry. Please forgive us. And God says, okay. And he restores them. He just backs off because he's not a wrathful God. He's a loving God. He loved the people of Nineveh. 
he gave them a chance to repent because he's a gracious and loving God who's slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness. We serve a good God. But it's hard for Jonah, and sometimes it's actually even hard for us to understand that because we're basically evil people. Sin has warped us and twisted us, and even the people who are nice have sin issues which will destroy them if Jesus doesn't wipe away that sin. Think back to the statement that God made about Nineveh being a great city. It was huge and important. It factored into God's plans. There were over 120,000 people living there. He did not desire to destroy them, so he gave them a chance through Jonah. Now let's bring this up here and now. Have you ever considered that every single human being is an eternal being who will either eternally enjoy heaven or eternally suffer in hell? Each and every person in this room and in this world is great and important because they will live millions and billions of years. Just like the city of Nineveh, they are great. There is a purpose for you. There is a plan for you. And we have been sent out to those great people who do not believe in Jesus yet. Every single Christian is a missionary. And our mission is to do the work of God that Jesus started. The work of saving the human race from themselves, from their sin, and from the punishment they have earned by their evil deeds. Listen closely here and now. God does not desire anyone to go to hell. Sometimes we think God just sends us to hell. He's a wrathful, judgmental God, and he hates people. It's not true. God loves people. That's the basic verse that I think everybody here probably knows. For God so loved the world. He loved the world, so he sent his son to die for you. That is the basic of the gospel, that he loves you so much that anyone believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. This world is in deep, deep trouble. They're more evil now than it's ever been, and we have the good news that they need. So let me ask you, do you love the people of this world? Do you love the people of this world? Do you love them more than your own comfort? Because we have to tell them. It's our mission. It is our calling. Because God started that. He loved the world so much he sent his son. He didn't hold anything back. We must not hold anything back. We must tell the world. It starts with your family. It starts with your neighbors and your friends. I know that you have people in your life that need God. And it's not your responsibility to save them, but it is our responsibility to tell them and love them and keep on doing that. You have a message of power from God to the world. You are a part of the plan to save the world. God entrusted that to you. God is not bellowing from on high about Jesus. Do you know why? Because there are millions of you. We have that message of hope. We need to tell the world. So if you believe, don't throw that chance away to be a part of the amazing plan to save the world. And if you're feeling this in your heart or on your shoulder right now, we're going to sing a song. And I'm going to challenge you to be brave. And if you feel the Lord tapping you on the shoulder and you're like, this is it. I need to give my life to God. Then I'm going to sit at the front row and I'm just going to pray with whoever comes. And if there happen to be more than one or two of you, the elders are going to be watching and they'll come pray with you. But if this is it, if you're like, I need need God, I can't, there's not a coincidence that I've heard this today. We're going to pray with you. We're going to meet with you and do that. I want to pray for you now and I'll invite the worship team up. And we're going to sing together. Lord God, I thank you so much for the hope that we have in you. You've been so gracious and loving to us. And Lord, I confess that I have been an ungracious, judgmental person. And Lord, I do not appreciate sometimes the gift that you have given to me. But today, Lord, I got a flash of that. And you have been so good to us. You've been so good to me. Thank you for forgiving my sin. Lord, as we worship you now, I pray that you would be glorified. I pray that you would send us out as missionaries from this place. And I pray, Lord, for, my, for the people here who don't believe in you, who haven't committed their hearts to you. Lord, keep tapping them on the shoulder. Bring them up today. Lord, let us start new life in people's lives today. We love you in your name. Amen.